Hello and welcome back to Hathor Hosts. Yes! Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. It's so lovely to have you all here wherever you are joining from in the world. I cannot believe that two years ago we had our very first show. And guess what? Just like an annoying guest or relative at a Christmas party, COVID is still here. <laughs> it's still lingering like, you know, a guest just overstays their welcome. But thankfully, things have resumed largely all over the world. Life is getting on and getting back to normal. And thank goodness for that. I am so delighted that every time I meet you wonderful people who watch this show, you talk about how you want more content and how much the show meant to you, particularly in those early days of lockdown. And so because of that, it seemed like completely the logical choice to go full circle and start again with my very first guest, primarily because I still had my baby legs on on that very first broadcast. She almost got the date and the time wrong. Between the two of us, we were like, ooh. <laughs> But we got there in the end. So I felt it was only right to do her proper justice because not only is she a multi-talented actress, she is a singer, a songwriter, a playwright, a screenwriter, and has a brand new film out, which we're going to be talking about. Please put your hands together for an enormous internet welcome for the fantastic, the gorgeous Kate Hewlett. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. I thought you were going to say like an annoying relative, like a friend that just won't leave. Kate Hewlett is back. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> she read the first draft. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, it's so lovely to see your beautiful face and welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm very impressed with the intro and the oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we've we've got to, we've grown up a little bit, I think, since we yes. last saw one another in this realm. <laughs> yes. In and fact, I figured out my calendar. I I got the day right. I know. Yay us. <laughs> Um, so much time that, for makeup. <laughs> I love it. I love you. you. Look gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. Fresh faced <laughs> and wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> So I was going to say so much has changed in your life, particularly since we last met, including you have become a mom. Yes. <laughs> yes, I have. And yes. that all happened during the pandemic. Is that right? Yes, I was very busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a very big two years, I have to say. Very, very crazy two years. And uh, yes, a surprise, surprise baby, surprise oh, miracle nice. baby. Um, who is now 16 months. Can't believe that. I know. That's extraordinary. Know. And Kate has warned us, everyone, that her dad, her darling dad, is doing babysitting duties on his own. So we may have, um, you know, a guest star at some point in the show, which I think is absolutely yeah. fine. <laughs> this, anything could happen in this door, through this door behind me. We'll see what happens. It's just like the Stargate, anything and anyone could come through it at any time. <laughs> she could come through and be, she could be 40 years old. <gasps> wow. <laughs> that would be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, Kate, what I thought we might do this evening, rather than start and follow your career in a kind of chronological way, um, is just possibly dip in and out on some of the things, particularly your more recent credits. Mm -hmm. But for anyone who might be unfamiliar or who has been living under a rock for the last however many years, just to recap, Kate, you were born in Toronto. You're the youngest of three siblings, one of whom is the wonderful David. Four. Oh, my apologies. No, it's okay. Four siblings. Okay, but you're the baby, which I love. The baby. We, use, we, we usually leave David out, so it's three if you don't, <laughs> if you don't include the mistake. <laughs> is David the naughty one in the family? I get the feeling he might be. He is. Yes, he is. Yeah. I'm second. I'm second naughtiest. But um, yeah, he is very, very, he's cheeky, that one. Yeah. Well, speaking of cheeky, I absolutely loved when I read somewhere in one of the interviews when I was looking, uh, doing my research for the show, that you got into acting primarily because I think David and your sister were into the arts and into performing. 
but you sort of, in your own words, took the role of Maria in The Sound of Music. <laughs> I did, I did. I saw my friend last night, actually. She was at the screening, the, my friend who in grade five yeah. played Captain Von Trapp because I was like, I'll do Maria, no problem. I've got this, yeah. <laughs> I'll take one for the team. Yeah, take one for the team, yeah. <laughs> and that was it, right? A love affair was born with the theatre and with performing. It was, and I, it's, you know, and the more I... Uh, I asked David's advice and, and uh, you know, should I go into this career? And he always said, no, whatever you do, don't do that. So I, I, I pushed back and it was very smart of him actually, you know? Yeah. <laughs> do you think, cause that everything he said, you were like, I'll prove to you, I can do it. I'll show you. He was, no, I don't know what it was. I just, I guess I don't take his advice. Although he does give good advice, but I think he just didn't want me to have a difficult time, you know? Yeah. He had been through difficult years with this crazy business. And I think so he was like, you know, don't go to theater school. Don't be an actor. You know, he did always say, though, write your own stuff. Whatever you do, always create create work for yourself. And that was that was good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, that brings me very neatly on to that question, because I wanted to know where this um, love of writing came from and how you knew you could do it. You know, not everyone can do it. People say, well, oh, I'm going to write mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same as writing in a journal, writing something yeah. that actually gets published and produced. Yes. And I, I think, you know, there are a lot of actors who want to write stuff for themselves because they want to act. And that's fine, too. But sometimes it comes from a place of, of frustration with career or something like that. And I guess um, for me, I did always love writing. I, I used to, um, as a little kid, I used to write poetry a lot. And I always loved rhyme and rhythm and all of that. Um, and I wrote songs quite young as well. So that is, it sort of makes sense to me looking back that mm -hmm. I ended up here, but I didn't write scenes and, and plays and that sort of thing until, until later. It actually scared the crap out of me. I, yeah. I, I signed up for a playwriting course at Queens University in here in Canada. I signed up in my first year and I did one class and I was like, we have to write a play. I don't know what I thought was going to happen in playwriting 101, but I was like, I can't write a play. I don't know how to write a play. And so I dropped it. And I wonder sometimes what would have happened if I'd stuck with it because I didn't get back into playwriting for another like seven years or something. Mm. So I do wonder about that sometimes. I think I really am a firm believer in that things happen to you when it is the right time. Yeah. And, you know, perhaps seeing that and feeling completely intimidated or overwhelmed or whatever it was, or just thinking, mm -hmm. I can't do it, may not have produced your best work. Whereas seven years later, you kind of were like, okay, I'm ready. I think I can do this now. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I needed to, I think I needed to figure out some things about myself first as well. And I needed to give acting a go. And because I wasn't even sure I wanted to, you know, I, I didn't even know if I was going to stay in the in the business because I was it just seemed so difficult. It just seems there were so many obstacles and uh, yeah. yeah. So it happened when I was a little more confident. Do you mean obstacles in terms of trying to get your work seen and done or as an actress trying to get auditions? I think as an actress, to be honest, and I can't remember if I spoke to you about this last time, but I think as an actress, I just, I was never um, a skinny person. Mm -hmm. And I just believed at that stage, and I do think it's a little bit better now, but at that stage, I believed I couldn't do it because I didn't look a certain way. And every time I met with an agent, they would tell me, you know, even at the age of 12, I was told to lose 20 pounds when I was not, not overweight at all. Um, and that sort of began the whole thing. And like the whole thing. Uh, so I, I struggled with that for a long time. And I, I just sort of thought, okay, well, I don't look the way I need to look and I don't want to have an eating disorder. And I don't, so it was, I sort of decided to move away from it. And then it, it, it pulled me back in. And I, I think what's been really positive is that I, at a certain point, just decided this is who I am. This is how I look this week. Um, and I just had to sort of go for it, you know, and I think it became, it actually became, when I moved to Vancouver for a short time, I think, and not to insult anybody, but I think a lot of uh, Vancouver actors may come from like 
not so much the theater side of things, but maybe more the modeling side of things or, right. you know, it starts with modeling and then, which is great. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there were a lot of auditions where I was the only person who wasn't wearing a lot of makeup and, and very thin. And it actually made me feel different in a good way. Like I, I felt like, okay, well, if they want that, they have all these options. Exactly. If they don't want that. They only have me. <laughs> so yeah. I started to see it as a as a, a good thing. And I yeah. think that that helped. And I guess with writing, I don't know. I just I think I I couldn't imagine like a lot of people. I just couldn't imagine writing a movie or writing a play or it it just felt like a huge feat. So that side of it was quite intimidating yeah so that came, that came later how many years uh into your kind of writing exploration would you say that you wrote your like first play that was done and produced well the so the funny thing is with the swearing jar which is the the movie that's at tiff right now um i started writing that play when i was in theater school so oh oh very nice oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's some good producing there. Um, yeah. So I started writing that when I was in my last or second year even of theater school. Wow. So that was 2002. Uh, I started writing those characters. Yeah. And so it's almost my first and my and my most recent at the same time. You know, it just has been such an epic journey with that one. Yeah. I think that's so – I'm so pleased you've mentioned that because I think so many people – have so little idea and why would they but to know just how difficult it is to get a project made mm -hmm. you know before it's even to get a green lit as one issue but to actually get a film made produced mm -hmm. and then to get people to come and see it and all that stuff is just it's such a monumental battle yeah. so you know this is a some a project that obviously has had many incarnations which we'll chat about but as we've seen the lovely poster uh you said it's just premiered at tiff which is the toronto international film festival for anyone who doesn't know what that stands for the play has opened to rave reviews which i'm not surprised about standing <laughs> ovations so let's take a little look at the trailer and then let's uh chat a little bit about the uh, swearing jar which by the way my phone kept up uh, my computer kept um changing to the sweating jar which is another thing. <laughs> I could use one of those also <laughs> <laughs> let's take a look at this at this wearing jar uh, trailer <laughs> I'm going to begin with the first song that I ever wrote for Simon it's called too smart I awkwardly smile I have some news. Are you? Oh. No, 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 no more swearing. We we have to be role models from now on. Holy frickin' poo! Five bucks in the cursing jar. Oh, I hope you weren't smoking on the lawn. I wasn't smoking. I was quitting. What's the news? my too smart love. I swear I will never ever love anyone else. <laughs> In the window. I can't hear you. Sorry, what are you what are you writing? Lyrics. Do you write songs? I'm more of a singer. I'm wondering if maybe you'd want to grab a coffee with me sometime. Oh, wow. Uh, I can't. Do you want to play music with me? I don't believe in collaboration. And yet it exists. I have been playing around with some lyrics. So you've been playing around with lyrics to my song? I've been thinking about you a lot. You're honest, aren't you? You're a good person. Oh my God. You wanna know what destroyed my marriage? Secrets. Are you going through something? I mean, is there something on your mind? Secrets are a bit of a deal breaker for me. Lies even more so. It, it's not that simple. What's that? Are you cheating on me? Swear to me. What? Swear to me that everything is okay, that we're gonna be God, okay. Okay, I swear. We fight and we fall. Listen to me. I like you. Everything was going so well. It took me so long to find my way, and when I'm with you, I feel like I'm lost. What's wrong with being lost? It's a rare and miraculous thing to find your one true soulmate.
Is it conceded? Is it conceded that I just got teary at my own trailer? Not at all. It's so, I cannot wait to see it. I cannot I can't wait. wait. To see it. <laughs> so this is the little play that could, not that it's a little play anymore, because as we just discovered pre-watching that, it started 20 years ago. So what was the incarnation, uh, the original kind of incarnation of it? Okay, so it started as a play about a couple who were trying to have a baby. That's where it started. Mm -hmm. That's not where it ended up, but that's where it started. Um, and I started writing to theater school. I wrote a different play when I got out of theater school. I wrote a different play first because it was a simpler story. And this one was very daunting. Yeah. And then I, it was a 20 minute play that I did at this tiny little festival. And then I built it into a, a fringe play for the Fringe Festival in Toronto. That was an hour. Then I created a two act version for New York Fringe. Then it was published. Both of which won awards, everyone. She's been very modest. So <laughs> it won the best in Fringe in Toronto, yeah. and then uh, won the outstanding new play in New York, which is incredible. Anyway, and then after New York, what was the process then? After New York, it was published, and then it was nominated for a Governor General's Award, which was really exciting, re yeah. very exciting. Um, and then I guess after that, I started writing the screenplay. I adapt, I started adapting the screenplay. Um, and it, I just kept tinkering and tinkering and tinkering with, uh, with the play even. I just, um, so like a few weeks ago, so you know Samuel French? Mm -hmm. you know, Samuel, those copies of the play, yeah. right? So Samuel French just published it. Ah, so that means yes. it's be available here in the UK. Oh yes, yeah, and you can get it online as well. And I'm and I'm much happier with this version because I got to change the things that bothered me about the original publication. Like right. there was an intermission for no reason. It was just like to sell cookies for one of the versions. So <laughs> I literally put in an intermission just so they could sell stuff. Uh, right. So I got to take that out, and I got to actually add some things that were in the movie. So it was really really interesting to go back to the play after doing the movie. Yeah. Yeah, they they have um, they have republished it. So that would be the latest thing that's happened, even since the film. And was it an easy transition to make it into a screenplay? Did you kind of feel this feels like it's a film, or was that trickier? It always felt like something wasn't quite working for me. And I when I would go to see it, or even if I was in it, I always felt like. It, yeah, just something wasn't quite working. And I realized when I, when I, it wasn't even when I wrote the screenplay, it was when I saw the film and what Lindsay and McKay had done with it, that I realized that it was always meant to be a movie. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because I, I, didn't, I didn't see it as a movie in my head, but yeah. I, I, well, I guess I sort of see every play as a movie in my head, weirdly. But I, I just, I didn't know it was going to be a movie, but when I saw it, it all felt right. Yeah. And I think one of the major things, you know, without giving away too much about the story, I think the play very much starts as a comedy. Mm -hmm. And when you have an audience and live actors doing a live performance, they feed off each other and yeah. the performances can grow a little bit and the the laughter informs the, the performances. And it, if it goes too comedic, you can't get it back. You, you mm. can't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And I think what's so lovely about what the director of the film did was that it's just honest. Everything yeah. all the way through is honest. They're playing everything real. So sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's heartbreaking, you know, sometimes it's quirky, some, whatever it is, it's just, it feels very consistent throughout. And that I really appreciated. I have to say, I also love that her last name is McKay. I mean, talk about like- I know. <laughs> like a little kind of hidden Easter egg in there. <laughs> Ridiculous, right? I know. Yeah. I saw yeah. in an interview that you were raving about the cast that you got. And I wanted to ask as the writer, how involved in casting are you? So, if at all. I mean, this, again, this process was absolutely insane because I had, in 20, 2012, I think, I had a different producer, a different director. I was going to be in it. 
the people who were in the play were going to be in it. We had all these different people attached and yeah. then that completely fell through. It just all fell through. And I think we were going to do it for like $20,000. Like it was right. going to be small, small, small. That fell through. Then I hired my sister-in-law, Jane, to produce. That's right. So it's a family affair, which is amazing. Affair. And then with Jane, we had four, three different directors. So it went through three different directors, which all with their own idea of what it would be and, and you know, beautiful notes and thoughtful. Every, every single one brought something so different to it. And with each of those versions, different casts. So, you know, it, it, it could have been a hundred different films. And by the time we got to the last version, I was less involved because I was pregnant. I was working. I was stepping back from it after, because it was getting to be a little heartbreaking how long it was taking to get it made. Yeah. And so I sort of removed myself a little bit from the process and I watched all the auditions and I weighed in, um, but I wasn't heavily, heavily involved. So mm. It, I watched Adelaide Clemens' audition and I, I mean, it was, it was, I just had chills thinking about the audition. Like it was just so beautiful. Right. She just understands it. She just understood the character and everyone who has seen the movie is like, it's you, she's you. She's, yes. she's just channeling you. And I can't see that cause I don't, you know, I don't really know what I'm like, but apparently yeah she just has my mannerisms and things like that. And apparently her singing sounds exactly like me. People keep asking if it's dubbed and all. it's so weird, but we don't know each other. We didn't know each other. How but amazing. I have so to weird. say, when I watched the trailer the very first time, I thought first I was like, is that Kate? And then I was like, oh no, it's not Kate, but no. is it a cousin, another sister? Because there is no, definitely no. like an essence of you. Yeah. Yeah. It is wonderful. It's wonderful. And when you talk to her uh, in real life, I mean, she's Australian and she's not like she 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 really is just the most phenomenal actor. I I, I hope that she becomes a total superstar. You know, she's done a lot of work, but I don't think people know her as much as they should because she is really extraordinary. And her 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 performance. I mean, she she honors the punctuation. In wow. the way that she, you know, and somehow it's effortless. She, you can, she, she'll put in an ellipsis because there's an ellipsis there. She'll, she'll take the comma. She'll take. It's just wild to watch, but it feels yeah. like she's just speaking. So, but I mean, that's also because the writing is good as an actor. Thank you, thank you. I hope so. No, it's much easier to make stuff come to life and soar and sing mm. when the writing is good and sort of trips off the tongue it's so mm -hmm. hard to make that stuff fly when the writing is not good <laughs> yeah yeah um I it know just, that, yeah sorry you were gonna say no I was just gonna say I think also I've seen you know there were a lot of amazing auditions but I've seen people read my work or audition or whatever and they just don't get the rhythm like they just don't it just doesn't jive and then they start adding words or or adding a lot of space and you just can't right you just can't and so to see someone who just gets it right away it's just the best feeling and particularly when they don't know me yeah to hear it and go oh okay she gets the she gets it from reading it yeah. that, was, that was pretty special uh -huh. and I know you had mentioned earlier in a kind of early interview that you had written a small part for yourself in the film but you were unsure as to whether or not you were going to do it because you kind of wanted to be on the set as the writer. So right. did you end up doing it or not? No, I didn't end up doing anything because I had a baby. Yes. I had a baby. So I just, I wasn't, I mean, I was originally supposed to play Carrie 10 years ago and then I aged myself out of my own movie because it took so long to, <laughs> I was like, I, either I have to, either we have to do a complete rewrite of this thing or <laughs> I need to let go of this part. And I wasn't old enough to play the other part. So, uh, so yeah, I originally was supposed to be her. And then, and then I wrote the part, I wrote a part, there's like a lovely uh, doctor in the, in the film and the actress's Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Her name is, yeah, doesn't, I'll get her full name because I know she's Nadine, <laughs> but that's not helpful. Uh, but uh, so that part I was going to play. Right. And then I was extremely pregnant. So we decided, no, let's cast it. And I'm so glad we did that because she's great. 
And then I was going to play a background. I was going to be in the background in the coffee shop. And I went into labor. I went into labor three weeks early. <laughs> Not meant to be in it this time. <laughs> oh, and I wasn't on set. I wasn't on set as a writer. I didn't, I mean, I didn't get to do anything. I was, I was, yeah, Georgina came three weeks early and that was it. Like, I'm was here. <laughs> yeah. Ta -da. She, she's, it, it's very in character. She, she has made every decision for us. Including, oh, I just, yeah. I have to say your um, photographs on Facebook and social media of her, I just, some of her facial expressions are the best thing ever. I was like, I just want to see like a movie with just Georgina's like you know, Monday to Sunday faces. Oh my gosh. I did an audition once where I didn't have a babysitter. And so I was holding her for the audition. I was holding her in my arms and I'm like, okay, I'm never doing that again. Because all you look at the whole time is this baby. She's like, yes, who me? Oh my god, worse than David, yeah. Just <laughs> every every yeah. She's great. She's so feisty and she's she's great. She's really strong willed and I love it. And she's also just got a lovely nature, you know. She's such a sweet yeah. baby. And as you said, like it was a complete uh whoopsie, an accident, so a happy accident. So that's even better. <laughs> did I tell you did I tell you that story last time? No, but I, I seem to, I think David Reed uh, interviewed wow. you for something and we were, I was listening to that because you were talking about like how you'd been through all these various processes and then out of the blue she came. So she okay. was, yeah, she was definitely destined to, to be with you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Re I had a relatively new, you know, I won't go into detail, <laughs> but I had a relatively new partner. Yeah. And I had been told I couldn't have kids. So I was like, don't worry. <laughs> It's been a huge adventure and uh and he's uh his name's Greg Hocko, my partner's Greg Hocko, and he's a, a a percussionist, conductor, musician, uh composer, amazing guy who is like meant to be a dad. So it's been wow. really fun. So music, I love that music features so heavily in your life because I was going to say, not content to have acted in The Swearing Jar and written it and produced and written the screenplay, you also wrote all the songs for it. So talk us through your songwriting process. Does it differ largely to your um, screenwriting process or fundamentally do you just go, that's an idea I want to do and I'm going to write about that? I find writing songs comes very quickly and and more easily than screenwriting to me because I just sort of they just I get an idea I start to write the lyrics I I it comes quite easily then I figure out the tune I don't play any instruments well enough to write on them so what I have to do is I have to record my voice humming the tune and then I record the harmonies that way as well. I put the lyrics and the and the melody together, and then I go to my one of my musician friends and I say, "Here, <laughs> figure out the chords." And uh, and my friend Chris Stanton, who is credited on three of the songs, he was such a big part of this from the beginning because he played one of the roles. He played the the singer who plays guitar and in, in the play. Right. Every, he, he did it at the Fringe, he did it in New York, he did it in Winnipeg, he did it all over, and also was too old by the time we went to shoot the movie. Uh, <laughs> but so he, yeah, he helped me with, with the song so much, and I felt like he was such a big part of arranging the songs that I really wanted to, um, to finally get his name in there mm -hmm. as a co-writer for a few of them. Wonderful. And all the actors sang their own songs, right? I mean, it's them singing, what I mean, your yes. songs. Yeah. They did, yeah. I mean, Adelaide is, that was just a bonus, you know, that she's yeah. like a glorious singer. She really is. She's she's much better singer than I am. She's, when you can, when you hear her do other stuff too, like she can sing jazz and all kinds of things. But yeah, she's got a gorgeous voice and she doesn't know she has a gorgeous voice. So she's got this vulnerability when mm -hmm. she sings, which is another thing we really wanted. Yeah. Like it, it couldn't feel like a concert like yeah. it couldn't feel like some, you know, it just didn't it wouldn't work that way. So that vulnerability was lovely and fear. And this wonderful film has now had its world premiere and debut. Mm. When might we be able to see it here in the UK or around the rest of the world? So we have distribution in the United States and in Canada. 
So it will be in theaters. I don't have the exact date because I'm terrible at my job. Uh, it's it's sometime near the end of October. It will be okay. released in the U.S. and Canada, not on a ton of screens. So you, you may have to seek it out. But it's also already uh, available for pre-order on iTunes. Oh, in, fantastic. In the U.S. So if you're in the U.S., you'd be able to pre-order it on iTunes, not in Canada for some reason. And we're hoping that TIFF will lead to some international. Yeah. That's what we're really hoping uh, for, because so far it's just North America. Yeah, I'm sure it will, because all the reviews I've read have just raved about it. And without giving any spoilers, they've all mentioned the wonderful, wonderful opening of the film, which you'll all have to go and see it to see what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That and that idea, that idea for the opening came from the very first director that we ever had attached. So, oh, and I, so it's, yeah, I love that. There are nuggets in it that have been there right from the very, very start. Yeah, we have, oh. and we have so many thank yous at the end because there's so many people who are in there in different ways, you know. Well, I mean, that's just it, isn't it? It does take, uh, I think it was the Queen's Gambit when that came out. Do you remember that came out like right at the beginning of lockdown and yes. everyone was like, what is this? This is amazing. And I saw a brilliant interview with a producer who was like, this has taken us something like, it was something like 20 years to get oh, yeah. made. Nobody wanted to do it. Everyone was like, what? Sorry, something about chess? Nah. Yeah. And like who wants to watch somebody play chess, right? It's yes, like the least... Really it sounds like the least dramatically interesting idea of all time. And yet it was riveting, right? Like completely riveting. Yeah. And when we started, we started pitching Swearing Jar, there were no musicals. And it's like, it's got a lot of music in it. It's, it would be considered a movie with music, I would say. But yeah. I mean, it, it was written before Once. It was written before La La Land. It was written, but, but nobody was making musicals. And it yeah. was sort of like, Ugh. Not sure about that. Do we really need the music? You know, that sort of thing. And then now it's like everything. And now we almost waited too long. But uh, yeah, there's a there's an appetite for it now. So oh, well, long, long may it have a successful journey around the world. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Um, I really can't wait for you to see it because I uh, oh, look, iTunes pre order. Okay, someone's on the ball. I text you uh, <laughs> when I've seen it. Um, I know that it's, uh, we're, I'm, we're over the 30 minute call because I'm gabbing away. So we know that you have this wonderful film out. Uh, you kept really busy, apart from producing a human, which is like exceptionally busy <laughs> and extraordinary. <laughs> you also were really busy with acting uh, in 2020 and 2021, um, mm -hmm. playing uh, in the Parker Anderson's Amelia Parker. And you were playing a mum in that, correct? I was. Yeah. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that and how that was juggling being a brand new mum while having to go to like your day job. Was that tricky? I was not. Okay, so what happened with Parker Anderson's and Amelia Parker? So those are two shows. Um, two shows that go together where one is from the perspective of the parents and one's from the perspective of the daughter and the, it, beautifully. Cool written. Oh, it's a great idea. And Anthony Farrell, who's the showrunner, brilliant. I would follow him anywhere. I work with him over and over again, but uh, I worked with him yesterday in fact, but um, it's a brilliant show. And I, this was at the beginning of COVID very beginning of COVID. We were one of the first shows to go into production when COVID hit. Right. Um, and I found out I was, I found out I got the part and I think I was like two on the call sheet. Like it was a big, you know, huge role to take on. And I found out I was pregnant three days later and then with COVID as well. So I was pregnant on a set for this entire, I think it was from September until January. I think, is that right? Wow. Something like that. Yeah. God, so. How was that experience? That must have just been tough for you. It was very scary. Mm. It was very scary because I already was worried about the pregnancy because I was so old. <laughs> I was, I was, so I was already worried. And then we, we were new to the whole COVID thing. So the producers yeah. at the beginning, there was no testing. They were like, oh, we'll test everyone except background <laughs> because yeah. it was like, what? Because there are only 200 of them. I mean, it won't spread at all. <laughs> also for them, I'm like, you don't care if they die? Like exactly. it was just so weird. It was so but oh everyone found their found their feet with with the the safety. We had a great producer. It was just it was new. 
Yeah. And, uh, but it was scary because I went from not, you know, I went from being locked in my home to being yeah. the very first day we shot in a hotel that was actually open. And you got people, you know, and I, and so it was, it was really scary at the beginning. And then I also, um, I felt pretty good. I had a pretty good pregnancy, but I was getting headaches. So that was not awesome. And I was so tired. So yeah. I think anyone who worked with me on that show probably thinks I'm the most boring human being ever. Cause every break I was like, <laughs> I <slept. laughs> yeah, yeah. do not hire her. She has a major sleep disorder. Um, but yeah, it was, it, but it was a beautiful show really great writers, really great cast. I worked with some amazing people and uh, I'm proud of what they, what they did, what they made. So, and yeah. Did that lead on to um, Overlord and the Underworlds, which you were co-executive producer on as well, correct? Reverse order, actually. Yeah. So oh. I was writing, I was writing Overlord. I was writing Overlord in the Underwoods with Anthony Farrell. Right. And I auditioned for the Parker Andersons before he took over as showrunner of Parker Andersons. Uh, I see. It was already, it was between me and someone else for the part. And then Anthony took over. And then I was like, you better give me the, <laughs> you better give me the role. Uh, so I, I did more auditions with him. Yeah. And, uh, and so then I, I went basically right from working with him as a writer to working with him as an actor. Fantastic. And that's so nice because you end up having like a real um sort of shorthand with somebody Absolutely. and you yeah. know completely lovely comfortable working relationship yeah yeah well speaking of comfortable working relationships as many many people on this show are probably tuned in because they're avid stargate fans let's <laughs> talk a little bit about Jeannie miller um i've heard the story but for anyone who hasn't heard the story before because it's a great story please let us know how you got the part in stargate so if you ask David, it was all him. So someone was, we were hoping to ask him and he was set to join us, everyone. But unfortunately, he sent me a text about 10 minutes before the show. No, a bit earlier to say that he's forgotten because Jane, his wife, is obviously at TIFF and doing her producer job. Um, so his wife is away and he has to take his child to the orthodontist. <laughs> I don't know how he feeds himself when Jane is away. It's really amazing. She runs, she produces his life. <laughs> amazing. Um, she actually is in Halifax because TIFF and and the Atlantic wow. Film Festival overlap. So she took off to Halifax and then David just, just loses all sense of everything. Right. They're probably <laughs> eating Doritos on the couch <laughs> right now. Um, but yeah, so David, wasn't I supposed to pick up someone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Why is it so quiet in the house? Uh, also, right, so yeah. so this is completely unrelated, but David, the other day I was, so David has a cameo in Swearing Jar. Yes. And the other night I was at a party, which first of all, he was allowed in and I was, they had his name written down, but not mine. And I'm like, I wrote that movie. I wrote it. <laughs> So like we only have a David Hewlett, um, but so we were there, and I have you know my my app with the baby monitor. Yes, I show I show David. I'm like, look, she's asleep at home, and I can watch her. And he goes, oh, look at mine. And he takes out his phone, and he has a lizard camera. <laughs> he has a camera on his gecko that he can watch. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and also, it never moves. I was just going to say, maybe he's got the camera because they move like once a year. They're like, yeah, it's just like, and you can't, and it's black and white. So you can't like, you can't see it anyway. He's like, I think that's it. No, that's a tree. I'm like, <laughs> and it's in his son's bedroom and he's a teenager. I'm like, well, you have a camera in your teenage son's. Anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe not such a good idea. I know. Right. I know. I'm like David. No. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so in, in an early episode of Stargate, I believe letters, Letters from Pegasus. I'm going to probably probably letters to Pegasus. Letters from I mean, I should probably, I'm sure someone, someone will correct me. Someone, <laughs> a thousand people are about to correct me. Um, <laughs> David had a, a line where he spoke about it. He was supposed to talk about his brother. And he went to the producer and said, what if it's a sister? And he just, yeah. letters from Pegasus. Thank you, Drew. Um, he, yeah, he said, what if it's a sister instead of a brother? Just an idea. And the writers were like, sure, yeah, that's great. And then the character ended up being written by Martin Garrow. 
Yeah. Uh, who also like we all sort of share a very similar sense of humor and the way we speak and things. So that that was really fun. Uh, but so he wrote the he wrote the character with me in mind, but I hadn't done a ton of work. So I had mostly done theater. So I had to audition, you know, to play my, my brother's sister. And uh, and yeah, and then I when I auditioned, I ended up getting it. Thank goodness. But it was it was really really cool, really cool, yeah. David, to do that as well. Yeah, and also I um I watched the episode McKay and Mrs. Miller, uh, or rewatched mm -hmm. it actually because I watched at the beginning of this uh, whole journey. Uh, I watched a lot of Stargate, but I rewatched that, and one of the things that's evident right uh, right away is how much chemistry you two have uh, on screen, and. <laughs> like the banter between you seems almost like it's ad-libbed and yeah. natural. And yeah. I wondered if that was on the page to begin with, or if the writers were like, ah, oh, that's sibling banter. We get it now. Mm -hmm. you know? It was written. It was written. I would love to take credit for it, but I think Martin Garrow had seen us do a dog's breakfast, which was the film that my yeah. brother wrote. And the dynamic was very similar, very different characters, but very similar dynamic. And, um, so I think he wrote sort of with those voices in mind. Yeah. But it was, it was, I think we hardly improvised at all. The only thing we both, we both went to, I think it was the director, also Martin. Yes, Martin Wood. Um, we went to the director and we were both like, there's this part where we're supposed to hug. And we both feel that we wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't hug in that moment. Yeah. And Martin was like, what? your siblings and like yeah we wouldn't hug. he's like but it's a big big emotional moment no we wouldn't hug <laughs> of course we did end up hugging <laughs> like maybe we're just uncomfortable with physical contact <laughs> in our lives <laughs> it's the only thing we tried to change because it was a pretty beautiful script so yeah it really mm -hmm. is and i think the relationship that you see on screen seems to me to be quite similar to the actual relationship you and david have mm -hmm. um, is that accurate or i mean and it's basic level Yes, it, the the relationship is very similar. Obviously, David is not McKay. Yeah, and I am no scientist. Uh, <laughs> but I think the I think the dynamic. We are very very mean to each other in a way that brings us both great joy, and so <laughs> I think that is there in the in the project very much in Stargate and in Dog's Breakfast. So. Yeah, I mean they're estranged. We we've never I think we were estranged for a year. We were once estranged for a year. Really? I can't remember why. Oh, he fired me. He fired me. He yes, fired. He fired me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He hired me to write music. He hired me to design to write music for his website or something like that. And I I don't know. I just Again, I was afraid of doing things before I was ready to do them. And I was like, I'm not a musician. So yeah. I just would show up and not do anything. And then he fired me. And then we didn't talk for a little while. I think that's what happened. In the end, you have to, though, because, you know, siblings and all that. Yeah. <laughs> also, we're just terrible at staying in contact. So we, we, we're we just, like, very, very, very close. But we don't talk that often. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. Yeah. We're, like, we share a brain. I love, um, completely love that. When I asked him, I said, oh, I was just wondering if you'd jump on maybe for the last bit. And he was like, any excuse to heckle my sister. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> Even at the, the, the premiere of the movie. Yeah. He, I wore, I wore very large shoulders. I, I went very dramatic with my shoulders. And all, the whole night, David was like, he kept just, he was like, do you need help getting through the doorway? He was doing things this like, <sighs> <laughs> You're like, yes, you better get used to it, kiddo. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we were saying she is a physicist and you yes. had your fair amount of techno babble, which obviously David had a lot of in the show. Mm -hmm. Did you, how do you have a way of like remembering tricky dialogue or did it just like trip off your tongue easily? Cause you're amazing. We speak very quickly. We both speak very quickly, which helps. So I think yes. that once the lines are learned, it does come, you know, faster than most human mouths will allow. Um, but I think for the most part, it was, it was just well written. So once I understood what I was saying, it was not too bad to learn, but I did have the first day of shooting. And I can't remember if I told you this last time, the first day of shooting, I had a total blank and it was the scene with, um, it was myself and Amanda and David. And it was that whole, like, uh, you know, I figured it out with finger paints. Like it was yeah. a very popular scene, but I, um, I just completely blanked. 
And it's sweaty, one of those sweaty, sweaty. I solved your problem in my spare time with finger paints. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tamar. I love, I love these fans. Uh, yeah, and I just, I just um, couldn't remember anything. And oh. David was lovely. Like he was, he just kicks into Big Brother gear, you know. Yeah. And uh, I just, I had, I had flown overnight, and I hadn't slept, and I, and I was also like oh my God, like there's a Stargate and there's an alien. I'm talking to an alien. Like what is happening? It just felt suddenly very overwhelming. Exactly. The first day I struggled with the lines. And then after that, as soon as I was comfortable, I was fine. Yeah. Do you have, I mean, it's happened to me only once in a job. Um, and it is, it's a weird thing for actors, you know, like the smallest thing can suddenly trip you up. And then I think when you get into your own head, Yes. Then that combination of like nerves and and then thinking, oh God, it's that bit coming up and I don't know how to say that. I had to play mm -hmm. a neurologist once in a live, it was like a, it was broadcast, but it was also, there were people in the room. So it was like a combination of theater and film, wow. but it was for a real product that helps people with multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> and I had some of the most terrifying techno babble and I just, I, I couldn't get it. So the yeah. other actress who was in it with me the night before we did our first performance, we stayed up till about five in the morning, just like going over, making drawings, like yeah. kids drawings going, this is this part of the brain that goes into here that does this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but obviously within a day we were fine. And I think it's that mm -hmm. same thing. Yeah, it's definitely when you you get in your own head and you start. It's like that voice, right? That little voice. It's like you're a loser. <laughs> that that voice is that voice uh, comes in, and then also, especially on stage. I mean, on stage, it's terrifying. Oh, terrifying. Because once it goes, you're like, oh my god, what am I doing? Oh my god, what am I doing up here? Why are people watching? Like the whole thing. If you're outside yeah. yourself, it is. And it can sometimes it's it's two seconds, but it feels yeah. like five minutes. And uh, yeah, so on film now, in film and TV now, I'm so comfortable on set for the most part that I know you yeah. can stop. I know you can just stop and go back and it's okay and no one cares. And no one's really, everyone's doing their own job on a set. Exactly. The, the prop person is not thinking like, you got your line wrong. The props person is thinking, oh my God, where is the knife? <laughs> exactly. You know? exactly. So everyone's, yeah, so that I, I, I do find it less nerve wracking now than I used to. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, you've come a long way, haven't you? Since, uh, what was it? 11 cameras. The very first thing you did. Yes. That was actually. Now that a was ahead of its time. time. It was way ahead of its time, way ahead of its time. That was such a good show. And it was all webcams before anyone had a webcam. And it was like, the, it was like this, right. It yeah. was, and talking to the, talking right to the camera. Uh, but it was, that was a great show to start with because you were alone. You were talking to the lens and I could sometimes have the lines if I needed them. I, I would have yeah. them like stuck around the, so it was a good, I did 19 episodes of that and it was a very easy way. Wow. In. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Stargate happened at the right time because it came straight after that, didn't it? Right after that, yeah. yeah. And were you offered all your episodes in one go or did they kind of air one and then go, we'll have her back again and again? They aired one, yeah. No, it was just supposed to be that one, one off. And then I guess the, the fans, enjoyed the character and I think um the writers enjoyed the character and so then they did yeah. another one and then another one and then I had a small part in uh the a fourth one so yeah just kept just kept going I, I I was hoping the show would go on forever yeah well there's talk of it maybe coming back and so I wondered yeah. if it did if you would be interested in either writing for it being in it writing and being in it mm. I would love to be in it. I, I think that my writing, I tried to write science fiction once once, and I did not, uh, I, it was not the best work I've ever done. <laughs> it's yeah. very hard. It's very hard. So I, I think probably, you know, if they offered me a writing job, I would take it, but I don't think I would excel. So I, um, no, but I would love to act again. Um. So before we hand over for some fan questions, which people have written in, and um, I'm sure we'll have some live ones as well, which uh, lovely Catherine can bring up for us. I mm. wondered, uh, what is next for you, Kate, uh, now that the swearing jar is out in the world? Great, uh, great question. So I have co-created a show um, 
I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to talk about it, but I keep talking about it. So we'll just see what happens. But it's a it's a show called Sing Out that right. I created with my very best friend, Andrew Musselman. And it is a really, really fun, irreverent, silly show. Uh, AMC Studios picked it up and now we've got some interest here um, as well. So we're we're going to be working on, we're doing some development with a network here. So we'll be rewriting. So we're doing that. And then I think I have a job starting October 3rd uh, in a writer's room, co-exec producing and, and um, writing a new show for Crave. Right. And um, it's a, a dark comedy that I love based on a book that I read, which is a great book. And uh, I'm really hoping that that happens as well. And that I, I can definitely tell you about that. Although I don't have a contract yet, but we'll, you know, it's looking let's good. Will it, let's will it into being. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that one is called One Day We'll All Be Dead and None of This Will Matter. <laughs> and isn't that the truth? I right? mean, if we've, learned, if we've learned anything over the last two years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not to move by. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a really, really great project, though, and I'm very excited. I, I, I don't think I've ever prepared so hard for an interview in my life as I did for this, so... Hopefully it all happens. And that's a TV show? Uh, I a TV yeah. show, yeah. It's a TV show that we would be starting the writer's room in the fall. And then yeah. I think going into production, I'm not sure exactly when, but sometime next year. So that'll oh. be a long, a long job. Yeah. And for you were saying like you've never prepared so hard in your life. So what kind of, what does, what does Kate Hewlett do to calm her nerves the night before a huge either audition or something like that? It's still an audition when it's writing. Yeah. How do you handle that? I just, um, for this one, I, I did a lot of reading. So I read her book. I read the, the Bible for the show. I read the pilot. I, and I did all of that twice. Right. And then I made notes. I made I came up with jokes. I came up with jokes for the interview. You know, I came up yeah. with things that I wanted to talk about in the interview. I, yeah, I just, I just had it. I had a lot of, I had it very well planned out and I ended up hitting it off with the, the two showrunners really well as well. So oh, it, it well, we wish you the very, very best with it and everything else that uh, lies in your path, because I have no doubt everything that you do is spectacular. Oh my gosh. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for giving us the time. So before we hand over for questions, um, mm -hmm. a lovely guy called Peter made us a little trailer for tonight. Now, I know we're halfway through the show, but I wondered, Drew, if we might be able to play the trailer for tonight. And then if anyone has questions uh, for Kate, put them up in the comments and we'll answer them as we go. So let's see if we can have a little look at this. Um, if not, we'll have to talk amongst ourselves. I like that it was like up close and personal was sort of the me in another lifetime ago. <laughs> you're so beautiful. You're so beautiful now. You're so beautiful in the clips. You're, you're oh. the most glorious face I've ever seen. Stop. It's all good lighting, but thank you very much. Okay, now I'm blushing. So straight into questions. <laughs> um, Somebody wrote in and said, have you had the chance to watch the recent videos of the Stargate actors, including David, reading the Stargate scripts written by AI, by an AI? No. Have you? 
<laughs> I caught a teeny tiny snippet of it. And actually last weekend I was with lovely Amanda at her convention in the UK. And we talked about that and she was like, it was bonkers. They kind of had a computer write scripts and then they just kind of read it out in character. Um, I mean, I kind of think if we've got a real writer in the room, why do we need an AI is what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's um, happening with acting too though, right? I mean. I know. Yeah. That I mean, scary. Yeah. Very, very, very scary. Yeah. Uh, somebody has asked you, you are both very good and passionate yeah. singers. Is there a song that you both like very much? And would mm. you sing together for us? Maybe not, <laughs> maybe not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right now, <laughs> ba ba black. <laughs> that's, all I know. Yeah, that's that's been your world for the last two years, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a busy spider. Yeah, uh, we should definitely sing together. Definitely, I will hold you to that. The next time we meet, I'd love that. Do you have a favorite song or songs? Like of all time, I guess. Top three. I need to think about that. That's a hard question. Yeah, I agree. It's a really hard question. You have? Do you have favorites? I have so I have so many different genres that I listen to That's and that funny. I love. You know, and like so, just off the top of my head, like for example, there's you know Patsy Cline. I love her voice, but I don't particularly mm -hmm. love country. Mm -hmm. but, so I will sometimes listen to something and think, oh, I love like how she does that or you know you listen to something like Judy Garland and it was such a specific way of singing so different to what we have now and how people sing now and then somebody like Adina Menzel has a very specific style so for me it's more about listening I think I mean probably anything Ella Fitzgerald did is mm. in my top three just because her voice for me is like it's so effortless and timeless and just oh loved like butter if, I, if I'm trying to think of something that I never get sick of, because I what I'll do is I'll hear a song, fall in love with it, listen to it over and over and over and over again, yeah. and then be like, ugh, I never want to hear that song again. Yeah. But, but I would I say, I would say, um, I say, uh, every time we say goodbye. Oh, I love that song. Never get sick of that. Yeah. And a lot of... Um, is that Cole Porter? Who, no, or Gershwin? Who wrote that? I can't remember. <laughs> anyway. True. Yeah. Um, I don't know who wrote it. I, I, my, the version I'm obsessed with is the Nina Simone version. Oh uh, yeah. There's another voice. I mean, you know, we could be here for days going on about singers and songs, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, okay. So back to Stargate, uh, in season four of Atlantis, there's an episode where your character tells Rodney that he got lost at West Edmonton mall in Canada. What I'd like to know, has Kate ever been in West Edmonton mall? And did you ever get lost there? <laughs> I have never been to West Edmonton Mall. I have been to Edmonton, but I've never been to West Edmonton Mall. But apparently it is, it has um, roller coasters. I don't know if these are lies, but apparently it has a roller coaster in it. Wow. It's a mall with a roller coaster. Like it's enormous. Wow. So I think a lot of people probably get lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good answer. Uh, and then finally from me, before we hand over, we've got one. Thank you, Cole Porter. What? Was oh, that's right. You're right, you're right. Yeah, I think because I recently just started listening to Cole Porter again and I was like, God, it was just also so oh. ahead of his time. And obviously because he was gay, so mm. many of those songs were written, you know, when you listen now, particularly, um, oh God, what is it? Oh, Night and Day. You know, it starts with that like boom, 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 boom. With the beat, beat, beat of the tom-tom. And all the stuff about longing and night and day you are the one i was just like oh it's so oh. beautiful anyway yeah. <laughs> back to forbidden, forbidden love and all that like things things that you don't yeah you don't when you know what someone's real story is and you listen again it's like oh exactly yeah. and how exceptionally difficult it must have been to write about that mm -hmm. um but you know we have some of the greatest love songs of all time um mm -hmm. have come from him so we're very lucky to have them you know who um, I also adore? Sorry to go back to music oh, again. Yep. Who I also adore is Rufus Wainwright. Ah, I, I yes. Or Rufus Wainwright. Yeah, he's got such an extraordinary um, theatricality about him, hasn't he? It's almost mm -hmm. like the first time I heard him, I really didn't like him. Oh, and really? I think it's 
because I listened to a song and he he swooped up to the night. I just want to hold you. Yeah. I feel so horrible. I know, it's amazing. I was like, oh, oh, I get it now. (laughs) Um, Right, so I have one last question from me and then we can hand over and see if there are any questions on the chat. Uh, When Stargate returns, this person's very positive, that it is coming back. Mm-hmm. Would you like to see Jeannie working with Rodney on Atlantis or working at Stargate Command? Which will get me more episodes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the best answer. <laughs> I think it would be so strange to be on Stargate without David. I think it would be very <laughs> peculiar. I think we need our own sibling spinoff. Um, exactly. And please yeah. can I come back as the sort of nemesis to your sibling love of one another? I was going to say love mm-hmm. life. I was like, that sounds dodgy. Different. <laughs> Different. Yeah. <laughs> right. Let's see. Anyone got us a lovely question uh, from the group? I'm sure Catherine's been on it. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, Claire Cowan wants to know, uh, what is your most proudest moment of being David's sister? I so I would say two things it it immediately makes me think of I I immediately go to work you know go to acting work which is so silly because he's done he's done some incredible things with working with kids and I mean the guy is the guy is a genius he actually is a genius uh, he's just got a brain like no one else's brain. But I, I think I saw him in a, a mini series called The Boys of St. Vincent, which was incredibly depressing about uh, about child abuse in the Catholic Church. But I saw him in that many, many years ago. And he was a different character than I've ever seen him play before. And it was heartbreaking. And I remember just being like, who are you? So good. Yeah. Um, so as an actor, that was that was incredible and then I think also um with a dog's breakfast because he wrote it he directed it he acted in it Jane he and Jane produced it together and he made it happen and I remember just being on that set like this all came from you the whole thing came from you and also the fact that he did that for me too like wrote a role for me and you know it was it was that was pretty that was pretty special but I'm proud of him all the time I mean he's incredibly successful and smart and funny and yeah as i'm sure he is of you because you know ditto (laughs) (laughs) we don't tell each other you know but if you ask someone else in the family i'm sure they tell you that we're proud of each other so well this leads us very nicely onto the next question which is can you tell us any behind the scenes stories about a dog's breakfast i'm sure you have many behind the scenes okay dog's breakfast uh, Chris, who was yeah. in it, was that was actually my favorite day on set. Was the day that Chris Judge came in and acted because he, first of all, is stunningly gorgeous and has a gorgeous speaking voice and yeah. like melted butter. Get back to melted butter again. Uh, and so I was kind of like, <laughs> like I just was like, he was so <laughs> handsome and then so funny. Like his improv, his his uh, deadpan. That, yes. That's I feel like it would be hard to break. You know, I'm pretty good at yeah. making people uh, lose it on set in the wrong moments. But he was so funny and just such a pleasure, total pleasure to work with. No ego and hilarious. That's yeah. not a behind the scenes story. Um, well, it is. I mean, that's a memory that you have from that time. Was working with your brother and and the gorgeous Chris Judge. Yes. Yeah. And then I have a few like, you know, like um, inappropriate stories about Paul, but I maybe won't share them. Because he, he likes, he enjoys, he enjoys farting at the wrong moment. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be thrilled that I shared that, but there's like a Sorry, scene where I'm supposed to kiss. I, the show has had its fair share of talking about farting, so don't worry. <laughs> oh my God. He's terrible. He's, it's like his favorite prank. So like we're like under a blanket in one scene and we're supposed to be snuggling. And then I was like, oh God, Paul. (laughs) We used to have many, when I was on set with Chris Judge, he was always doing some sort of funky high protein diet, lots of eggs. 
Oh. And I just remember like we'd be standing and, you know, I'm playing, I'm meant to be playing this like seductive, you know, not my, yeah. not really my natural habitat. <laughs> and I would sort of be like really doing my breathing and suddenly I'd just hear this. <laughs> and the smell. Oh, Lordy love us. Anyway, let's not end on, on yeah. that. Um, so uh, Gregory one has asked, if you could make a movie or TV show out of any computer game, Oh, that's interesting. What game would you choose? Me? Yes, you. <laughs> the Ghostbusters game from 1987. <laughs> <laughs> that's the last time I played a game. I don't yeah. have, I don't have, yeah. Wor Wordle? <laughs> Can we make a movie out of Wordle? <laughs> I love that. I have to say Dying Light 2 because I'm in it. <laughs> and I would like to take the role of Sophie, which I play in the game, and make her a human, even though she would be quite a lot older now in the real version. <laughs> and then, Kate, the final question uh, before we say goodbye. Somebody, uh, sub-level 28, has said, I'm just dipping my toe into writing. What is the first thing a novice should work on? Good question. The first thing a novice should work on is just writing. You just write. It sounds simple, but you just have to do it. You, If you're trying to make it good, you will never write anything. Mm -hmm. You just have to sit down and write and allow it to be shitty, if I'm allowed to swear. Yeah. And if you, I, I, the next, so this, someone said this to me once and it helped so much. The first draft is shitty. The second draft, your work is to make it less shitty. The third draft, it's even less shitty. And you keep going until it's the least shitty version of the script that you could possibly write. And that's that's a really lovely way of thinking about it. Because if you're trying to sit down and write something brilliant, it just will never happen. And it's it's practice. It's a muscle. It's hard work. It's, it's um, yeah, it's just practice. And I think you're absolutely right. Not only is it practice, it's allowing yourself, giving yourself the permission to make it shit. It's okay. Yes. Like the yes. few things that I've tackled writing wise, because I would love to write, but I very much get into that. Like, oh my God, this is terrible. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. But the times when it's been good is when I've not done that and gone, I expect this to be shit, actually. Mm -hmm. This version, this first draft or second, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then just kind of let it go. And that's when the creativity comes, you know? Absolutely, yeah. And, and one of my favorite parts, my favorite part probably, other than the writer's room where you're coming up with the ideas, my my favorite part is when that draft exists, that first shit draft, it exists. And then you're yes. tinkering, or even if you're doing a complete overhaul, it already exists. And it's so much less daunting when that is the case. Absolutely. So to all the budding writers out there, just get writing, just do it. Mm -hmm. um, well, this, do you remember the, the book when we were little called What Katie Did Next? Yes. Yes. So I, for me, it's very apt because I can't wait to see what Katie does next. It's funny because um, I have a musical, I'm writing a musical about, about this show? what Katie did. Yeah. What? Yeah, well, we I've haven't been in a long time. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Gosh, so writing a musical, that's a massive undertaking. Again, it, it started, I, that one I started working on in 98. So, you know, that should be done by 2038. <laughs> it's been in the works. Yeah. Featured role, please, of a granny over here. By <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kate, it's been an absolute delight talking to you again. Thank you so much for giving us so generously your time. Um, I know that we are going to hear lots and lots more from you in 2023 and beyond. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to see you. And, you. you know, we we must hang out without other people watching us at some point, too. Because I just I enjoy like that. I, Yeah, I enjoy you very much. Lovely. I'd like that very much. Unfortunately, we're on opposite ends of the globe. But hopefully yeah. we'll make that, you know, when you travel, when I travel, let's try and do that yeah. then. We'll do a convention. We need to do another yes, convention. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so, guys, that on that note, I would just like to say uh, before we sort of sign off, thank you so very much for tuning in for this uh, one-off special. It's been such a delight being back in your company. A massive thanks to my producer, Drew, Catherine, and Aaron, the team who 
trust me, this show would not happen without them. I know Drew has just started a brand new job in Dubai. And so we have students from his school watching from Sharjah. So shout out to you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And to everybody, so much love. Thank you so much for taking half a host under your wing and supporting the show as you do. And who knows, maybe we'll be back for a Christmas special. You never know. Have a wonderful evening, afternoon or morning, wherever you may be. Lots of love to you all. Bye. Thank you.